This, dear viewer, is the Sony Cybershock DSC F707, launched in 2001 and sporting 5 megapixels, a 5x Carl Zeiss zoom, and a distinctive L shaped design with a body that could twist up or down. Oh, and it could even see in the dark. I remember reviewing it for various magazines back then when it was pitched as a premium camera, costing the best part of a grand. Just over two decades later, I bagged a slightly scuffed model for just £5 from eBay, which like many untested digicams sprung back into life given a new battery. That's a bargain for one of my all time favourite digital cameras, and in this video I'll show you what it can do and what made it special both then and now. I reckon Sony's F-Series in the late 90s to early 2000s represented the company's design and engineering teams at the top of their games. At a time when much of the industry was adopting increasingly traditional looking designs, the F-Series continued to plough its own path. Sony's distinctive L-shaped body made its debut two years earlier in 1999 with the F505 and its mildly upgraded successor the 505V. When I talk about the 505 in this review, I'm referring to either model. Sony wanted to make a big deal about the Carl Zeiss lens in these models, with its above average quality and range, so housed it and the sensor in a large can-sized barrel that rested in your left hand. Meanwhile, your right hand could operate the compact body section while twisting to face the screen up or down for easier framing at high or lower angles. Despite only being hinged on one side, the mechanism on all the models which employed it, from the 505 to the 828, all felt robust in your hands and smooth to adjust with a satisfying notch, letting you know when the lens barrel and body were both facing forward. It all worked brilliantly, and in my view, remains an ergonomic triumph, albeit one that's only practical with the smallest sensor, which is why we don't see it on larger sensor cameras today. The F707 inherited this core concept, not to mention a similar zoom range, but tweaked and upgraded almost every other aspect of the camera. Look at the F707 in isolation, and you may be forgiven for remembering the F505 as being essentially the same, but place them side by side, and the newer model, on the left, is clearly a considerably more sophisticated proposition, not to mention comfortably larger and heavier all round. Let's start with the main lens barrel, still housing optics branded by Carl Zeiss with a 5x optical range, but now chunkier to accommodate the slightly longer actual focal length required by the slightly bigger sensor behind it. Unlike many cameras, you could directly screw in filters, with the 707 sporting a fairly common 58mm thread. The 5x equivalent zoom range remained much the same as the F505 before it, roughly 38 to 190mm as seen here. But the zoom slider was enlarged and moved from the rear body to the side of the lens barrel, so now operated by your left thumb rather than your right. The new lens also featured a brighter aperture of f2 to 2.4 versus 2.8 to 3.4 on the 505, allowing it to gather more light and potentially deliver slightly shallower depth of field effects, although the potential in this kind of camera is minimal. Like the 505 before it, there's a pop-up flash atop the barrel, but rather than being manually released with a sliding lever, the 707 could now deploy it automatically. Meanwhile, behind the flash unit was the addition of a cold shoe for mounting accessories, and in the absence of a sync pin, there was an accessory port alongside for triggering Sony flash guns, or for connecting to remote releases. Unlike the F505's proprietary data port, hidden under an awkward and easily broken cover, the 707 now features a standard mini USB port behind a sturdier door on the barrel, allowing you to connect the camera directly to a computer and read the contents of a memory card. Finally, the side of the barrel featured a rearranged set of controls compared to the 505, but still allowed you to adjust things like the white balance, set the spot metering, and switch between auto and manual focus, the latter using a ring on the end of the barrel to make adjustments. Moving back, the main body was still gripped in your right hand and could angle up by around 80 degrees for shooting at low angles or at waist height, or down by about 40 degrees for easier viewing when held above your head. The grip on the 707 was however more substantial than the 505 and widened to accommodate a new finger dial with a push to click action and a dedicated exposure compensation button too. The 707 also ditched the basic three position mode dial of the 505 for a chunkier one inherited from the S85 and more reminiscent of a DSLR, fully rotating with satisfying clicks between each setting. The 707's mode dial gave you direct access to program auto, shutter and aperture priority, full manual, scene presets, setup menus, 
the movie mode and playback without having to navigate fiddly menus. The 707 had access to shutter speeds from a thousandth of a second to an impressive 30 seconds for long exposures and there was fine control over the aperture from f2 to f8 in 130V increments. Even the power switch was upgraded from a fiddly push slider on the 505 to a chunky collar control around the mode dial which flicked back satisfyingly. Again, the control and overall handling felt more akin to a DSLR than a consumer digital camera. As before, there's a microphone on the top surface, but the 707 accompanied it with an intriguing night framing and night shot switch, more about which in just a moment. Round the back, the biggest difference from the 505 was the addition of an electronic viewfinder in the top left corner. The 180K dot EVF panel was fairly respectable back then, but more important than the specification was having an alternative means of composition or indeed playback or menu navigation in challenging conditions. Many cameras of the day did have viewfinders, but typically were basic optical ones with inaccurate framing and no chance to review images or navigate menus. The 707 also ditched the hybrid LCD of the 505 where you chose whether to deploy a backlight or rely on reflected sunlight in favour instead of an always backlit panel. I found the 707 screen much easier to view and again you can switch to the EVF if preferred which gave it a big advantage over the 505. Under the viewfinder and to the side of the screen is another flap which opens to reveal a composite AV output for TV slideshows and a DC input for use with a supplied AC adapter. This is used to charge the battery in camera, but could also be used to operate the camera under mains power without having to buy an additional accessory. As with the 505, the battery and card slot are both housed in a shared compartment behind a door on the right grip side, but the overall growth of the 707 body meant it could now accommodate a much larger pack, the NP FM50, and as an infolithium battery, you'll see the live displayed on screen as minutes remaining. It delivered longer life than most rivals too. As for memory, the F707 unsurprisingly employed Sony's own memory stick format in the original full length chewing gum shape. Sony supplied a meager 16 megabyte stick to get you started, but since that was only good for about six or seven best quality JPEGs, you'd want to get a bigger one sooner rather than later. That said, the largest stick back in 2001 was only 128 megabytes, making it smaller than the biggest compact flash options available and a negative mark for what was otherwise a high-end camera. As for the actual images, Sony equipped the F707 with one of its new 5 megapixel, 2 3rd inch type CCD sensors, making it both physically larger and higher resolution than its predecessor. And unlike the 505V, which sported a 3.3 megapixel sensor but could only use 2.6 of them in practice due to its lens, Sony's upgraded optics in the 707 meant that you really could exploit its full 5 megapixel glory. But what sort of difference could you expect in detail if you're upgrading from the 505V to the 707? Here's a full image taken with the 505V on the left and the 707 on the right before zooming in for a closer look. The 707 version is definitely resolving slightly finer detail here, but I'd say it's pretty subtle. Firing up the menus in the standard photo mode lets you set the sensitivity to auto or 100, 200 or 400 ISO. The image size menu lets you choose from five photo resolutions with best quality images measuring 2560 by 1920 pixels in the 4x3 shape, while the picture quality menu offers fine or standard JPEG compression. Once again, fine was pretty mild and resulted in JPEGs measuring just over two megabytes each, and that's why you don't get many on the cards. Direct mode menu is where you'll find burst and bracketing options, as well as the chance to record audio clips or photos in a highly compressed email format, or as uncompressed TIFF files, although the latter are sufficiently large at 14 megabytes to tie up the camera for the best part of 30 seconds. Finally, you can adjust the internal flash level, apply one of three picture effects, and adjust the sharpening in plus or minus two steps. Set the mode dial to movie and you can record video clips up to 320 by 240 pixels at 16 frames per second with sound and the chance to silently zoom the lens while filming. The best quality HQ mode is limited to 15 second clips but by halving the frame rate to a choppy eight frames per second, you can keep recording 320 by 240 video until you run out of memory. There's also an even lower resolution, 160 by 112 mode at eight frames per second if you want to squeeze even more video onto your meager memory card. Like photos, you can also apply one of three picture effects and I'll show you how the 707's photos and videos look in just a moment. 
For more options, turn the mode dial to setup where you can adjust the focus area, movie format, whether to overlay the date and time, apply the digital zoom, set the bracket increment, red eye reduction, and the hologram AF mode. Yep, you heard that correctly, hologram AF, a feature making its debut on the 707 and allowing it to more easily focus under very dim conditions or even complete darkness. It works by using a low power laser to briefly project a pattern of diagonal lines onto the subject, giving the contrast-based autofocus system something to lock onto. Its success varies depending on the subject and the distance, but give it a person in a typical portrait or group composition and it will genuinely improve your chances of a sharp image even when it's very dark. But what if the lights have gone out and it's so dark you can't actually see the person on the frame anymore? This is where night framing mode comes in, inheriting a technology previously seen on some Sony camcorders. Night framing exploits the fact that most digital camera sensors are also pretty sensitive to infrared light, but normally filter it out to avoid unusual results. In night framing mode though, the 707 temporarily moves this blocking filter out of the way and shines a pair of infrared LEDs located around the lens to illuminate nearby subjects, thereby allowing the camera to produce an image even in darkness. Sure, the eerie greenish tint and eye reflections may look more like military night vision goggles, but remember this is just for framing. Once you push down on the shutter button, the camera returns to normal shooting mode and takes a standard color photo using the flash. This one could do with the red eye reduction, but you can see it's pretty well exposed and in focus. Even today, I'd say it's a pretty cunning solution for taking photos of people in very low light, like at events or parties, but it occurred to Sony that some might also actually enjoy recording the eerie greenish version. So enter night shot mode, which like night framing, temporarily moves the infrared filter out of the way, turns on the infrared LEDs and maximizes its low light chances by automatically opening the aperture and reducing the shutter speed. Bingo, you can now take photos of nearby subjects in complete darkness, like nocturnal wildlife, without disturbing them with a flash. But the ability to move the IR filter back and forth effectively lets you transform the 707 into a full spectrum camera, recording not just visible light, but infrared as well. Screw on a different type of infrared filter to block the visible light, like a Hoyer R72, and you could in theory have a camera that can shoot daylight infrared images without making any permanent modifications. Unfortunately, there are limitations. After it was reported earlier, camcorders with night shot modes could partly kind of see through certain materials under certain conditions. Sony modified the mode to only make it practical under the pitch dark conditions that it was designed for. Activate night shot mode on the 707 in daylight and the image becomes completely blown out due to the forced maximum aperture and relatively slow shutter speed that's no faster than a 60th of a second in this mode. So there's no official way to deploy it successfully in any modes that are designed for daylight use. But that's not stopped infrared enthusiasts from simply stacking neutral density filters alongside their R72s to compensate for the bright aperture and slow shutter speed in night shot mode while using tape to block out those pesky LEDs which otherwise cause reflections with your filters. Then with a little Photoshop magic, simply remove the green tint, boost the contrast or adjust the levels for a punchy looking result. Sure, the fairly slow shutter speed means that you do have to be careful about subjects in motion and maybe also use a tripod, but it can still deliver pretty good looking results. It's even possible to move the internal infrared filter using a powerful magnet, in turn allowing you to shoot full spectrum images and videos with full access to the complete exposure settings, albeit now with other limitations to be aware of. This feature was also possible in the F717 and 828, so I'll continue this story in my reviews of those cameras as I wrap up this one. As mentioned at the start, I managed to bag an F707 from eBay for just a fiver. It was scuffed and listed as untested, and as expected, the original battery had long given up the ghost and was unable to hold any charge. But replacement battery packs are available, and my DSTE battery pack, bought for other Sony cameras, worked just fine and brought this one back to life. I'm always amazed how many old untested cameras will actually work given a new battery, although replacements can cost around £15, so do factor that in if you're shopping for a vintage model. Meanwhile, memory stick readers may be rare today, but if you have a mini USB cable, you can connect the camera straight to a computer and just drag the images and videos out of it. 
So without further ado, here's some photos and videos that I took with the 707 around Brighton almost a quarter of a century after it first came out. See you in a minute. The F707 can also film short video clips in 320 by 240 pixels at 16 frames per second with sound and you can also zoom the lens while you're filming. Here's some examples to show you what's possible. Sony Cybershot F707 evolves a design concept that started with the 505 a couple of years previously. It inherited the L-shaped body with the twisting rear section, but beefed it up in almost every respect with a brighter lens, larger and more detailed sensor, upgraded controls, longer life battery, and the ability to focus, frame and record images in complete darkness. The F707 could literally do things that other cameras could only dream of, and it looked the part too. I loved it when I originally reviewed it in 2001 and it still makes me smile over 20 years later. Sure, it's heftier than the 505 but gives you so much more control and the images still stand up today. Sony further refined the concept in 2002 with the 717 which for me is probably my favourite in the series and I'll make a separate video all about it, devoting more time to those infrared capabilities which make this series sought after by many enthusiasts today. The F828 followed in 2003, and while that officially marked the end of the triple digit F series, the Cybershot R1 from 2005 arguably shares some of their design DNA, so I'm counting it as an honorary member here. While the 828 and R1 brought even greater quality and capabilities though, they became progressively larger and heavier still, and for me personally lost some of the charm of the 505 and 707. But one thing's for certain, they definitely don't make cameras that look like this anymore, and I do feel that the market is, well, less interesting for it. So tell me which was your favorite in Sony's F-Series? Did you own one? Did you buy one recently? Do you still use it? And have you explored the various infrared hacks? Let me know in the comments, as well as tell me about your first digital camera experiences, regardless of the brand, because they really do make great stories. And that's it for another retro review. As always, if you'd like me to make more of them, the best way to support me is to like this video, subscribe to my Dynabytes channel, and binge watch as many of my other videos as possible. Right, that's your evening sorted. Thanks for watching this one, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.